everybody and welcome back to another episode of Rapping with Reef Bomb. I'm your host Keith Berkelhammer and today I have the pleasure of welcoming Julian Sprung. Hey Julian, thanks for uh, stopping by and joining us. Hey Keith, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Well Julian, I don't know if uh, you know last week we had Jake Adams from Reef Builders on and um, I thought it would be kind of hard to top that show but we just might do it tonight, and and Jake is in the house. I know watching tonight. He says he was uh, you were his mentor. So, well, but uh, you know, listen, we have a lot of folks in the live stream. I could see in terms of the chat and and the numbers coming through. So once again, I encourage everybody to uh, to ask questions. I have a lot of questions myself, but um, love to make this uh, interactive and get folks engaged with, with Julian. It's, it's a real treat, Julian, to have you here. Thank you. It's a real treat to be here. So yeah. for those of you that don't know, Julian is a reef keeping legend and he's also a very accomplished author. He has co-authored a number of well-known books, including Corals, a quick reference guide, the reef aquarium series, which is three volumes and algae, a problem solver guide. Julian has also authored articles in aquarium hobby publications such as Freshwater Marine Aquarium Magazine. He wrote a monthly column called Reef Notes. I read that religiously. <laughs> Advanced Aquarist Online, Practical Fish Keeping, and Tropical Fish Hobbyist. With fellow marine aquarium enthusiast Daniel Ramirez, Julian co-founded Two Little Fishies in 1991, which is a manufacturer of aquarium equipment, supplements, media, and more. Julian is also a frequent speaker at aquarium shows and club events. So with that, Julian, I always kind of like to start my show off with uh, my guests and ask them how they got involved in the reef keeping hobby. So what's your story there, Julian? How did you, how did you get involved in reef keeping? Uh, yeah, well, I, I was in the saltwater aquarium hobby with fish first, of course, as met many of us. Uh, were. Um, and it was my brother, Elliot, who got me uh, interested in, in aquarium keeping. He had aquariums in a neighbor's house because my, my father wouldn't allow a saltwater aquarium in the house. Um, he was worried about the uh, salt spray corroding furniture nearby. 
Um, and so I, I was about four years old when my brother Elliot showed me his aquariums that he was maintaining in a neighbor's house. And so that kind of got me going with the bug of being interested in, in marine life. Um, he was keeping fish and invertebrates. And just to you know, put in perspective, I was four years old in 1970. Okay, so that, that was uh, part one. Part two, he used to take me uh, collecting with him. We lived on a residential island in, in Miami Beach. And so we, you know, we collected all kinds of little tropical fish here, you know, in Miami Beach. Um, and so by the time I was five, I had already started going off on my own and, and collecting. There were vacant lots on our island. And I would just go and, you know, shake sargassum weed or, you know, turn over live rocks at, at uh, low tide. So I, I was interested enough that I started going off on my own. Now, your specific question was about the reef aquarium hobby. And that, that's a really interesting one because in 1982, um, I was already for many years by then a, a saltwater aquarium keeper. My, my father had relented and allowed aquariums in the house for both my brother and me. Um, we had several. And in 1982, I was in high school and I got a job, a summer job at a local fish store. And the owner of that store sold it to a guy uh, from the UK. And that guy from the UK had been to Interzoo in that year. And he saw the Dutch mini reef systems that were shown then. Um, so he said, uh, I want to set up one of these here in the store. And that was one of the very first Dutch mini reef systems in the United States was at this store in North Miami. Um, he had it built. It had two corner overflows and I collected all the live rock for it. Uh, so this was summer of 82. Wow. Um, that was coincidentally also the same time that I had my first article published in Fama magazine. And it was not because I submitted it. Uh, it was because they saw it in the local Florida Marine Aquarium Society newsletter. I had I was the science editor in high school for the Florida Marine Aquarium Society. And uh, Don Dewey, the publisher of Fama, saw this article and it was about reversing head and lateral line disease. So I wrote that article. It got published in FAMA. That was my first. Um, I was 15 years old. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and that was when I started uh, with, you know, corals and live rock as opposed to just fish. How do you like that answer? <laughs> it's long. That, that was a very comprehensive answer, and and you um you mentioned Fama magazine, you know, and and the column I mentioned that I, I wrote it or um, read it religiously, I actually wrote a letter to you, and I was just floored when I picked up the publication one day and saw my letter in there. You know, you had actually answered. I had a I had a question about some problematic algae. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but. I was just... Oh, I remember. No, no. <laughs> no you don't. <laughs> it was a thrill for me to actually... I'm, I'm sure... How many letters did you get for that column? Um, per a lot, but not that many. Uh, I mean, I, every month I got letters, but it was not like a, you know, a mountain. Uh, the, you know, it was a manageable amount, and... Uh, nothing like emails these days or, you know, text messages or instant messenger where you could get thousands. But, um, you know, people did write and I enjoyed getting the letters. I think it was great. And I learned a lot from them. You know, it was a way of um, adding to my own personal experience in keeping aquariums, getting the feedback from other people and what, what they were experiencing. It augmented my, my reality. <laughs> What what are your so, what are your thoughts in terms of how things have changed? I mean, right? You you yeah. um, well known author have wrote um, several books, co authored several books that um, are considered really bibles in in the hobby. I um, I read your stuff and learned a lot. But uh, you know, today 
there are a lot of different and other channels of um, communication yeah. out there in terms of the information. What What are your thoughts in terms of how things have changed? Is you think it's um, well, uh, you know, it, it always fascinates me to watch uh, how the reef aquarium hobby evolves. A lot of the evolution is recognizing old ideas. That's that's is sort of uh, recycling happens a lot. Um, but there are every year really, really new ideas on uh, understanding of the chemistry, the physics, uh, and, and biology uh, that pertains to, you know, making a successful reef aquarium. Um, I, you know, I'm fascinated by it. I'm, I'm learning from it all the time, and, and that's what makes it such a, um, an interesting hobby. As far as my reaction to changes, uh, you know, I mean, all I can say is um, I uh, I enjoy to learn more. Uh, your previous guest, uh, Jake Adams, does a great job of, of featuring any new ideas, whether it's a new discovery in a in a coral or a fish, uh, or a new filter or a new light or you know new techniques. Uh, Reef Builders is a, a great place to see. Um, uh, new information like that. Uh, it's, it's to me terrific to see how quickly we can find out. When I was doing reef notes, you know, you guys were waiting 30 days for the next issue, which I had written four months before. Um, and, it, you know, it was a totally different time scale, what was going on. Um, we, we really uh, have sped up the, the whole cycle of information. And, you know, you might realize that you can have a very successful reef aquarium now as you could have had 10 years ago. But at the same time, there are new pieces of equipment that improve your ability to, to manage the aquarium, that make it easier, make it more fun. Um, and there, you know, every so often there's a new coral or a new fish, something, uh, you know, new that's uh, raised in aquaculture. I, I think that um, although for some people achieving success may bring them to a plateau and a level of boredom, I, I haven't quite got to that place yet. There's always something new for me to explore and there's always mysteries, you know, and some of them very frustrating. If it's not one thing, it's another with a reef tank, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, what about... Um... What about in terms of just having information overload and, you know, not every source of information out there is a good source of information, right? So, it's a, yeah, it's a good point because, you know, there's kind of a psychological presumption that everything new, uh, you know, displaces the old and this, you know, you got to uh, update your system or whatever. And um, that, of course, is not true at all. And, and. To have a successful aquarium, uh, you know, you can use very old technology and techniques. Uh, the basic core of, of what you need is, has been known now for, uh, you know, 30 years. So um, the fact that there's new information and new products, um, you know, it's great on the negotiation side and in the, in the business. Uh, people on a business cycle, they like to see what's new, what is your latest and greatest. Um, but it should, and when you say information overload, that, that is true there uh, in the channel of communication from the aquarium shop, from the dealer to the hobbyist, the perpetuation of new, new, new can be very confusing. And there's a benefit to um, having a foundation of, of basic techniques that are reproducible and successful. And if you want to explore something new, uh, sure, but don't don't um, figure that that's uh, the only way to succeed. You know that you have to chase that new new product. Well, uh, kudos to uh, to Jake Adams and Reef Builder for the super chat. Thank you, Jake. Really appreciate that. We're having a lot of fun with this series, and and um, just it's great to have some knowledgeable knowledgeable folks um, out there to uh, kind of share that information with. So, yeah. um, Julian, what, what do you think in terms of um, the role of reef clubs moving forward? I mean, back when I started in the hobby 25 plus years ago, you know, reef clubs were a very important part 
of um, the learning process and also the mentoring process. You know, I think um, perhaps in this day and age, they, they I, I don't know, maybe they're not as strong as they were before, but what do you think in terms of uh, reef clubs and, and the role they should be playing moving yeah. forward? Well, you know, we're right in the middle of a pandemic. And so, you know, reef clubs, uh, even before the pandemic, were uh, kind of getting into a lot of online uh, social uh, interaction. And the pandemic has forced it to really happen that way. Uh, I want to backtrack a little bit to the question you had about, you know, my start in the reef aquarium hobby um, and just mentioned that after my brother introduced me to the hobby, our family joined the Florida Marine Aquarium Society show or Florida Marine Aquarium Society. And it was at the Florida Marine Aquarium Society show in 1973 that I, you know, just became a total addict because uh, even though it was that long ago, this was a show in the uh, Museum of Science in Miami, and people uh, would bring in their aquariums, and they would set up uh, aquariums for a competition, and they brought all the rarest fish and invertebrates. It was a spectacle back then, typically about 100 aquariums wow. in a show, and they would get, you know, easily 10,000 people or more would come through. It was really an event for the whole city, and... It got me hooked uh, big time. My brother got me started, but then seeing all of these things that people were keeping, was it was fascinating. And I looked forward to every month uh, we had meetings at the Museum of Science. And at those meetings, there was always a speaker who would make a presentation, uh, educational. There was a question and answer section. They had a library where you could check out books. And, you know, you could interact with everyone. There was a social hour and, you know, just talk about your aquariums. I know a lot of clubs do that um, still, but it's probably less than it used to be. I think it, it's very, very helpful, that whole mentoring that happens in these clubs. Um, they're, they're really great. Uh, although what's happened now with, with different forums online for the clubs, I think it does facilitate an even wider dissemination of information. Um, but I, I do enjoy the, the interaction face to face, um, Florida Marine Aquarium Society also had field trips back then. I think they still do on occasion, you know, they'll do aquarium hops, but they used to do, uh, collecting trips. They would go down to the Florida Keys, you know, the whole bunch on a bus with a, a bunch of boxes of Dunkin' Donuts and, and away we went and brought our buckets and aerators and collected, uh, whatever usually for just before the Florida Marine Aquarium Society show in the summertime. It was, it was great camaraderie. And, uh, there's still a few people involved in the club that I know from back then when I was, a, you know, little kid. Yeah. Clubs are a lot of fun. And, um, I had some, I had a club visit my, uh, my house in Connecticut a number of years ago. They all got on a little, I think mini bus and they came up from, might've been Queens in uh, the New York city, uh, outside of New York city. And they just came to, to check out my tank and we all sat around the tank and talk reef and they learned from me and I learned from them. So, you know, it's great to kind of like have the, uh, that one-on-one -on -one yes. connection. And hopefully when, when we get past COVID that stuff can yeah. kind of pick back up where it left off. And I look forward to it. I hope so too. I, I got to add to it that I have done the same sort of thing all over the world. These clubs, of course, exist, you know, in Europe and in, in Australia uh, and in South Africa, um, in the Middle East, uh, I've and Japan. I've I've done that very same kind of travel around, visit shops and home aquariums, and sit around, have good food, good wine and learn things. Uh, it, it's um, an international uh, way of, of sharing information, and it's the same wherever you go. Uh, yeah, no, it is. And it's really important part of the hobby in terms of learning and, and being able to, um, you know, kind of get to that next level as a hobbyist, I think. But um, mm -hmm. so Julian was very kind enough to shoot some quick video of his tanks at the uh, two little fishies uh, offices, right? 
Julian? No, no? Uh, the videos that I, I sent you were from home. Gotcha. Um, I thought I'd have a chance to send you vid more videos. I just didn't. It was a crazy, busy couple of days. Um, I could at, at another time send you other videos uh, from Two Little Fishies, but the ones I sent you were from home. All right. So, yeah. um, and folks, thank you so much for the super chats. Great Bearded Reef, Star City Reef. Really appreciate it. John Reef of Vermont, Remarkable Reefs. Thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. We really appreciate it. Um, so let's, uh, let's play the, um, the video you shot, Julian, and I'm going to start um, rolling it now, but it's going to probably take about 20 seconds or so for it to pop up onto um, to okay. YouTube, and, and I think you're watching along on YouTube, right? Yeah, okay. I do have the screen. So um, let's, uh, once you kind of see it pop up there, maybe you can kind of walk us through what we're looking at here, and it should be any second now. Here we go. I grabbed Here we go. Four, four or five videos. I don't remember now. And I figured I would make them relatively short so it wouldn't take too long to upload them. That's a gigantic elegance coral, it looks like. Yeah. Gorgeous. I have, a, I have a bigger one at Two Little Fishies. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's about twice the size of that one. At one point, elegance corals were not that easy to keep, right? That's still the case on certain uh, morphs of them. It's a really complex uh, problem. Um, it's not the case for these. I'm not keeping any difficult morphs. I'm really good at killing them, just like everyone else. <laughs> the, the ones that I have are easy to keep. So, Julian, just kind of tell us about your... Um philosophies in terms of keeping your reef tanks and, and, and what you, um, you know, what, what your practices in terms of the equipment that you use, the husbandry and that sort of thing. Well, I, I, I have to say that, um, there's an assumption that since I'm a, as you said, a legend or, a, you know, an authority or an expert or whatever you want to say that whatever I'm doing has to be the latest and the greatest. And unfortunately that's, that's not the case. Um, I, I do have some, you know, nice equipment on some of the tanks, but most of them are fairly bare bones. And, and, um, the, I have like a promissory note for each one of them that someday I'm going to do this, um, because I, I you know, I'm the shoemaker and, and my children, there's holes in their shoes. So, uh, it's hard to, um, have the time to, to, you know, trick out all your aquariums, uh, exactly the way you want them. So, uh, but as far as philosophy, I, uh, a couple of things, um, I like to make, uh, an aquascape look as natural as possible. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of, of a huge rock wall with a few little corals on it. I, I like to see big corals and I like to see them growing into each other. Um, if it's a reef aquarium, uh, many of you who, are watching now also are aware that I like uh, mangroves and seagrasses. So I've set up some aquariums that are not reef aquariums that, but which feature mangroves and seagrasses and a few corals uh, that are compatible for that type of habitat. Um, let's see. I'm also a big fan of Gorgonians. Uh, so I like to include them in a lot of the reef tanks. Uh, as far as maintenance goes, um, I, I, I don't use lots of filters. Um, uh, most of my aquariums currently are running without protein skimmers, wow. although I would use them if I had the time and, and place to put them. Uh, they, they do make a difference. I, I've used them, you know, extensively in the past, um, the current setups that I have, only one of them really has the appropriate place for a skimmer. Um, and I will rectify that um, in a couple of ways. I'll get around to putting a skimmer in that one. And in the other ones, I, I need to revise the uh, design of the sumps um, to be able to incorporate skimmers. Uh, because um, as the fish population increases, the the deficit, the missing skimmer becomes more noticeable uh, in, the, in the maintenance of the aquarium. 
Uh, I do I do like algae filtration, whether it's in a uh, refugium or in a you know an algal turf filter or a ketomorpho reactor. Um, I, I think that's that's very helpful in stabilizing the aquarium in many ways. Um, so uh, you know, two little fishies, uh, markets, uh, bio pellets, the NPX bioplastics. And I know that that's really, really popular. We do sell a lot of it. Um, and it, it helps people who have, you know, high nitrate levels uh, to deal with that. Um, my aquariums don't have that problem. So you, you won't see that on my aquariums, even though, you know, I understand the technique and, and it's something that um, lots and lots of people use. Uh, we get, you know, amazing amount of feedback from maintenance companies that are using it and maintaining the lower nitrate levels because their their clients have big fish and they're feeding them a whole lot i i maintain systems with a decent fish population but uh not over the top uh and i do feed my fish every day um but uh the balance that i i've achieved i i haven't needed to to do that supplementation um beyond having refugia or or algae uh, to take care What's of um, what what are your nitrates and phosphates typically at in, in in your tanks? Yeah, um, there are differences, but typically in in the range of uh, five parts per million or less on the nitrate, um, and some of them, uh, you know, below one part per million, so really really low. Um, the phosphate uh, is typically around 0.02, um, occasionally a little bit higher. Um, but I, I try to keep it at 0.02 or lower. Yeah. So you also are a fan of using sand in your reef tanks, right? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, shallow, mm. deep. Um, typically about an inch to two inches, not more. Yeah. So, um, not so deep. The only one that has a deeper bed is the, um, mangrove tank at two little fishies. Uh, you may have seen that one online. Unfortunately, I didn't send a video of that, but, um, uh, Richard Back was over today and he may post something online today. I don't, I don't know. Uh, he was shooting some video with his iPhone. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it has a large mangrove tree and, and really needs about a three inch plus sand bed to properly, uh, stabilize the tree. Do you, um, maintain your sand beds or do you kind of let the uh the cleanup crew do that job for you i mainly let the cleanup crew take care of that but um in a in a reef aquarium um i do occasionally siphon out sections of the sand because after a couple of years they they do become fairly mucked up with with detritus especially um next to the rocks because of the way water flows uh, around an object that's sitting in the sand, it tends to cause uh, detritus to really accumulate right at the basis of rocks. Yeah. So I, every couple of years or so, I will siphon out a section, not the whole reef, but a section into a bucket when doing a water change and really um, stir it, throw out the uh, excess detritus, and then put the sand right back. Um, now, you mentioned uh, rock. These days, yeah. in terms of getting... A hold of live rock it's a lot more difficult than it used to be in, in years past what what's what's your preference when you start a tank it would it would it be well, a live rock um, if it's i mean i know where you are located it's probably pretty easy to get to uh well no i mean i don't collect my own live rock it's illegal to do so um and two little fishies makes a product called stacks right. uh which is a you know natural limestone sliced and so you can quite simply build a beautiful aquascape and then put your corals on it. If you want to put some live rock uh, in as part of the decoration that will seed the aquarium with uh, coralline algae. And it's only a matter of months when you maintain calcium and alkalinity levels near saturation that you're going to get both the coralline algae and the corals growing and, and your base becomes live rock anyway. The, the nice things uh, about dry rock, of course, is you, you have no aptasia, you don't have mantis shrimp or bristle worms. Um, so, you know, the benefits of live rock are the uh, microfauna and microbes that come with it. So 
it's it's good to add a little bit but when you add big pieces of rock uh, you know you you bring some some creatures that you don't want in there um, if if you're making a um, planted marine aquarium as opposed to a reef aquarium then the benefit of live rock is you often get lots of uh, macroalgae uh, so my view would be that if you were doing a planted marine aquarium then you probably would want to put some of the plant rock or live rock that way um, yeah you know it's um and i've talked about this before on on this show in terms of my experience with live rock versus um dry rock up I had um, one tank that I started with dry rock that was just, I just had, um, I had a lot of trouble with it. I had dinos, I had uh, bacterial bloom and I probably went through it um, yeah. too quick in terms of the, um, that process and um, probably didn't use enough in terms of the bacterial boosting type of products that um, I needed. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you just really have to? Um... It's part of it. So what, what you have to understand when you're starting with dry rock, and you're putting it in a reef tank that you've put so many watts per gallon of light, you know, you're really heavily illuminating it, and there's no other things growing on that bare calcium carbonate substrate, uh, diatoms and dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria are going to say, yay, good, I've got, a, you know, I've got territory, and it, there's a succession. And the way you get over that is by really pushing the calcium and alkalinity, you know, to supersaturation and maintaining a really decent number of herbivores. Um, there are other methods of managing dinoflagellates, for example, you know, using ultraviolet sterilizers to reduce their free swimming populations. Um, you know, sometimes the dinoflagellates get in there and the herbivores can't, you know, eat any other algae because the dinoflagellates are toxic and they're mixed in with the other algae. Um, we all get these headaches at some point in, in reef keeping and a new aquarium uh, has a higher incidence of problem algae like that. Bare dry live rock is by definition like a new aquarium. So, you know, if you have a good amount of corals to put on the rock, uh, that helps. Um, having the herbivores from day one helps and uh, maintaining the saturation state of calcium carbonate helps because then the corallines will grow and that once they're on the rocks, you, you won't have any issues with the dinoflagellates. Yeah, dinos yeah. is, um, that that's a tough one. I mean, and you mentioned UV sterilizer. So is, you know, in terms yeah. of what um, I understand, using a UV at night while the dinos are in, in the water column can be effective yeah. as well as uh, raising nutrients is that um, something you found to, to yeah happen? there's there's a lot of anecdotal um, information that you can find on the web of everybody you know with a dinoflagellate problem trying this or that uh, the uh, the issue about nutrients I think you know some people have considered a dinoflagellate issue to be maybe related to the red field ratio, you know, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and organic matter. Um, what's true is if you change the ratio, sometimes uh, a photosynthetic organism like a dinoflagellate will react negatively and you'll think you've achieved, um, you know, success, but sometimes they come back, they can adapt. Um, in my experience, the main issue with dinoflagellate blooms is a, a disturbance in the aquarium, whether it's uh, an old tank where you uh, vacuumed the whole bottom, really disturbed that uh, stable uh, biological bed, uh, or, you know, uh, an organism dying like a leather coral dying, you know, creating a big nutrient pulse, then afterwards you may see uh, a dinoflagellate bloom until it achieves a new stable state. Um, it is a frustrating problem, and there, there isn't a very simple bullet answer to it, um, other than you know trying to get your tank back to stability, uh, which uh, often takes uh, time, uh, rather than actively doing something like water changes and vacuuming. It's better to just kind of let it be. Um, I'm yeah. going to just interject here and thank Jake again 
for the uh, for the super chat. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of change topics a little bit here because I've seen it in the chat a few times. And, and Chris at ACI Act Culture, thank you also for that super chat. So when when I had Jake on the show last week, yeah. we were talking about um, aquarium controllers and and how. Yes you know, all the, uh, the different functionality and things that, that you can do with aquarium controllers. And, you know, I think Jake and I were, uh, we're sort of on the same page in terms of not leaning on them too heavily. And I think Jake's uh, quote was, I am the controller. And I see that in the, uh, in the super chat. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> what are your thoughts on aquarium controllers? I, I think that for the right application, they, they do provide a, a very useful service. You know, it gives you, um, uh, you know, the controllers typically have meters, right? So you, you're able to take readings. And now that we have our smartphones, you can check what's going on from anywhere in the world. Um, but yeah, I too, I don't, I don't rely on controllers uh, to do the important tasks. I, I, I tend to work on a semi-automatic uh, mode. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, controllers absolutely have a place in our hobby. Uh, they inspire people to dream and, and do wonderful things like uh, Jamie Craggs, who's using controllers to uh, promote uh, corals to become sexually mature and spawn. Um, and that recognition has been shared with public aquariums around the world and they're doing that and it's involved in reef conservation in the Caribbean. Uh, this is great. It wouldn't be possible without controllers. Uh, but for the average new hobbyist to be, if they were to be told, well, hey, you can set up this tank and the controller takes care of it for you, I think that's a bit misleading. You need to be educated on how to manage it yourself. Then you can use some of the elements of the controllers to make your tasks easier um that that's the way i look at it yes i think yeah. it would be very dangerous to be in complete autopilot with a reef tank yes personally I, thank you uh great bearded reef for that uh, super chat as well as the remarkable reefs folks really appreciate it and uh certainly throw the questions into the chat we got a lot scrolling through here and i'll do my best to keep track of everything here um okay. just looking at some of the comments I, I may be uh, looking at the wrong place in YouTube. I just still see your background thing. Was I supposed to? Oh, maybe maybe you're not seeing yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the 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 yeah, chat in, in real time. No, yeah. that's that's quite all right. Um, so Julian, let's let's dig back into the um, to the algae. Um, quite, quite, oh, there I got, I got it. Got it. All right, I'm, so now you're seeing everything there. Um, just uh, looking at some more of these questions. I never got to see the video, which, which one. Oh, but okay. That's, a... that's why. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, Julian, in, in terms of fighting problematic algae, what are your thoughts on using chemicals like ChemiClean or fluconazole for bryopsis? What are your thoughts on that sort of thing? Well, um, I know from all the years that um, ChemiClean has been out on the market, they're, you know, there are a lot of hobbyists that have depended on that for dealing with red cyanobacteria. Um, I have not personally used it. I mean, I've had red cyanobacteria in my aquariums as anyone who's had a reef aquarium has at some point. Um, I've gone my own way of, of dealing with it through control of nutrients, but people who have aquarium maintenance businesses and they've got a, you know, several hundred gallon system full of fish and it turns into a red slime ball, they want a quick bullet to solve it. So there's always going to be a place for that, you know, where the client says, Hey, my tank looks terrible, quick, treat it. Boom. It's just like, uh, the, uh, pool guy, you know, <laughs> he's got to make sure the pool looks nice and spotless and clean. It's it, so there's a place for it. Um, in my own reef aquariums, uh, you know, I, I deal with different types of algae, usually in a, in a different way, whether it's increasing the water flow where it's needed, um, you know, using um, filter media like a GFO to take the phosphate level down or activated carbon. Um, when it comes to a, a product like uh, fluconazole, which is, you know, a whole other subject, uh, bryopsis uh, is, uh, you know, 
an alga that that makes people crazy. It's it's um, very very adaptable to all kinds of water quality conditions and does not um, rapidly disappear when you get the nutrient levels to nothing. Uh, so that that was I think a pretty major breakthrough that people discovered this antifungal um, strongly influences the the life of of bryopsis. Um, I have not used it, but I, I've seen enough feedback online from people uh, using it that that does seem to be a um, um, a treatment that's that's recommended uh, and reproducible success. When I've had bryopsis uh, appear uh, in my aquariums, it's typically only in certain spots. Um, it might appear on a, a branch of coral where the tissue has receded and you get a bloom of bryopsis. I normally would just snap that off as soon as I notice it so it doesn't spread. Um, another place you commonly will find bryopsis is in the grill of an overflow mm. or any suction intake if it's illuminated where there's a bright light. If I've seen that happen, I take those off and scrub them in fresh water and make sure that it, it's absolutely killed, um, then, then replace that. So uh, I, I've rarely had any uh, blooms of bryopsis that got beyond those um, you know, initial little spots. The only exception to that would be my pond. Um, I have a saltwater pond and the video that didn't un upload, I think was the pond video. Um, in its first year or so, there was uh, a period of time where the nutrient levels were higher and bryopsis got started and it did take over. The whole pond became a bryopsis wow. hairball for several months. And my wife said, I thought you said that this was going to be easy to take care of. And I <laughs> said to her, well, it, it will be. And she said, when? And I said, well, um, you'll see that this, this bryopsis will go away um, well, how soon? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, but it will, which it did. Um, it, 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 uh, I didn't, I could have gotten the fluconazole, but I, I didn't. Um, I, uh, I put in herbivores, several urchins. They really didn't touch it much. Um, but the nutrient levels came down. Uh, I got in there and pulled it out because, you know, when bryopsis is growing really well, it just, it grows. Um, so I pulled it out and my wife was saying, you're going to keep doing that. And I said, yes, yes, don't worry, go away. And it, and it did. Um, it probably was a few months uh, where, you know, I wasn't proud of how the tank looked. But um, all of a sudden there was less and then less. And now, you, you know, you won't find any. There's none. Um, but that pond is not a reef tank. Um, there are some corals in it. Uh, the bryopsis was growing actually on the liner, on the walls, all the way around in the pond. Um, and it spread onto a couple of gorgonians that were there. Uh, but there's not really much in the way of rock in this pond. Um, there's a mangrove, there's sand. Um, and so it was relatively easy to manage. Uh, it was just a matter of time for it to stop growing on the uh, the walls on the liner. And it, it did. Um yeah, I um, a, a while ago I had some bryopsis in a uh, in a frag tank, and so you know after a while of of trying to like pluck it and pull it, I, I think what I did was I just released more spores by doing that, and, and it got to yeah. be a real infestation. So I I hit it I hit it up with fluconazole, and it um and it wiped it out. But okay. it you know what it came back like in three or four months and. Yeah. I don't know how um, careful you have to be in terms of making sure, you know, the certain pieces of equipment on, on the, uh, on the tank are properly, I don't mm -hmm. know what the word would be sterilized or what have you um, sanitized to make sure that there's no spores that were left over. I, I don't think you can. I think every single reef aquarium has bryopsis and that realization recognition that Every single reef aquarium has it, but it's a problem only sometimes in some aquariums. Just, you know, it can give you, you know, a peace of mind that you can beat it. It will, it will eventually go away. 
the fact that fluconazole is now available as a treatment, I think, is a you know is a terrific blessing. Um, so you know when it's out of hand and potentially harming corals, that's when you need to you know actively do something about it. Right. But you're never going to get it out of the aquarium. I you know in my reef aquariums here, I occasionally see a little patch, and when I do, I you know. If it's on the glass, I scrape it off, turn the water flow off, scrape it off, suck that little bit out. Uh, if it's on a coral where there's a, a dead spot, I break it off, and it never gets beyond that. That's that's how I uh, eventually beat this, and I'm I'm knocking on wood right now. My uh, probably fake yeah. wood desk or whatever it's made out of, but um, right. that's how I've uh, beaten it since it came back from the fluconazole. Was I was doing what you're talking about? I was breaking off. If it was grown on a um, a branch of a coral or something like that, or base of a plug, I'd snip the yeah. coral off the plug and get the plug out of there. If it was on the A crate, I'd get the A crate out of there. I was very careful right. not to rip and shred it and let other spores potentially get into the uh, into the water. And so, yeah. if if you can remove it yeah. cleanly and get those nutrients under control, I've found that to be um, you know so yeah. far an effective way to to get rid of it once in a while you get lucky with uh, i mean if the aquarium's big enough with a rabbit fish any of that group uh saganid fishes uh once in a while you get one that'll eat it mm. and then you're home free <laughs> yeah. uh, so julian you mentioned um, gfo as a way to get down phosphates that you sometimes use yeah. that um so can GFO not only bind phosphate, phosphate, but other valuable trace elements as well? Do you have to be careful with the amount of GFO you use for that reason, or is that not really something you can no. be concerned about? Um, it, it does absorb uh, some metals, and a lot of people consider that to be a, a benefit of it. Um, so, yeah, in theory, it can be reducing some trace metals down, uh, but... I, the, the main concern with use of it is the effect on alkalinity. As it pulls phosphate, it also reduces alkalinity in the aquarium. Most of us who are growing corals, um, you know, are already supplementing to boost alkalinity. So um, then you can just think of your GFO filter as like another coral. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that is another sink for alkalinity. Um, that... That's all, the only main concern. What about hydrogen peroxide for treatment of algae? Is that just a Band-Aid? Um, yeah, in a, in a way, uh, there, there's two camps on this. There, there's the um, treat the frag plug you know, method where you're spot injecting hydrogen peroxide right on the algae itself. And um, I know that uh, Justin Grable, you know, just incredible, has done some experimentation with actual dosing in the aquarium. Um, I've always been afraid to promote that idea because each aquarium has a different um, organic load. And uh, he, I think he had devised some, what he considered very safe uh, range of how much you could add uh, for the benefit of, of curbing algae growth. Um, and he may have published that. You might want to take a look for something he may have written uh, that might be published online. Sounds um, good. Um, so, yeah. Julian, let's let's shift gears a little bit. And I, I saw Jake was kind enough for another super chat. And in, in his super chat message, he said Acro Power. And I've seen Acro Power come up a few times in the oh, uh, in the chat yeah. here. So let's talk about coral nutrition. So Acro Power is is a two little two little fishies product. That um, yeah. can you can you talk about Acro Power and how it came about and and how why why it um, is something that um, you feel is important for for coral health? Yeah, um, so Acro Power is a um, a blend of amino acids that is intended uh, for a reef aquarium in general for corals. Uh, the name Acro Power just was so powerful that you know I thought that that would be the right name. For an amino acid blend, but um, it does benefit uh, LPS corals as well and uh, sea anemones. Um, they all respond really well to it. So, um, in some respects, I think we uh, goofed in naming the product in a way that that kind of 
focuses the attention on the SPS corals. Um, so, you know, bear in mind that it benefits the, you know, the whole coral community that you have in a reef aquarium. Uh, how it came about, well, there were already, already several amino acid supplements in the marketplace. Um, and there was a period of time, it was actually uh, a few years, where some of our own distributors were saying to us, and this is rare, you know, the, um, the tail wagging the dog situation, but they were saying to us that, you know, you've got competition selling amino acid supplements. Why don't you do that? And at the time I said, well, I don't know. The way I see it is that if you feed your aquarium, you know, the fish food has the proteins and the protein supply, you know, they're made of amino acids. And if you feed adequately and you feed the corals, the coral food, they should be getting all that they need. And that wasn't wrong, but um, what happened was enough people, including Jake Adams, who you mentioned here, um, really were twisting my arm saying, Julian, have you tried adding amino acids to your aquarium? And I said, no, I haven't. I feed my aquarium. And they said, you really, really should look into this. You should try it. And I said, okay. <laughs> Um, so Jake was one of the most persistent of them, but it was actually, um, a couple of our distributors who were also, um, a hobbyist, not just business people had said, you know, I've been trying this and it really makes a difference. So I said about it and said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try single amino acids and, and just dose them at different dosages and, and see what I see just pure qualitative uh, stuff. And there were certain ones that, that I didn't really see much and that, you know, that was confirming my, you know, nothing's here. Um, and then there were some where the results were so dramatic that I just had to sit down and think, damn, why is this happening? Um, because I, I come from a, a background in biology, you know, a scientific background. And, you know, I started looking at the literature and there is literature about the importance of amino acids for corals, how they're utilized in forming the skeletal organic matrix. And there's all, you know, and they analyze different corals and they see what amino acids are, are there. Okay, fine. That's no big surprise. We know that. And, you know, in theory, the corals are getting them from their food. Uh, and even the literature says, yes, they're able to absorb them from the water because it's been, you know, labeled organic uh, amino acids put into the water, they're able to absorb it. Okay, so they are able to absorb it. But why would the addition of single amino acids, the pure amino acids, have an influence on the coral that was different from the food that has a blend of you know, all sorts of amino acids? And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I know that the difference is very noticeable and that's what Jake and others were trying to tell me. Uh, so, um, once I saw that, I thought, okay, you're, you're right. And, and now I see a benefit to this and it's, it's worth developing a product. So, um, then there was the whole process of, of figuring out how to blend it into the highest concentration, stabilize it so that it had a shelf life. Um, and yeah. Acropora, Acropower was born. How, um, how does that differ, that product versus other products out there in terms of that blend? Is there anything that... Um... Well, I have not done a, um, an analysis to look at my competition. All I did was I, I chose what you know, made sense uh, based on the reaction of the corals um, and you know how how we could blend it and make a uh, shelf stable product so julian yeah. we got a question from uh, remarkable reefs he's asking uh, both you and i what are your thoughts on dosing live phyto and rotifers yeah um I, if you're able to do it i'm all for it i i like any kind of food whether it's um dry preserved frozen live um, amino acids, as we just spoke about, 
any of those things, they're all beneficial. So, um, you know, some hobbyists get very sophisticated and set up automatic feeders that are adding live food. Um, if you have the skill to set that up and you can do it, that's better than not doing it. it there are benefits. The, the corals will respond and the whole uh, aquarium will because you have uh, fauna aside from the corals in there that are going to be feeding on the uh, phytoplankton and the uh, rotifers. Jake just did another super chat and he's saying coral power. <laughs> yeah. But, what he's pointing out is what I mentioned at first that, that my choice of the name was, was perhaps not right. And, and I have mentioned to him that there are other things that could be blended into a product like Acropower that would benefit other corals like LPS. And so, yeah, at some point, um, if I could just slow down <laughs> at some point, I, I will, um, do something about that and make a product uh, that we could call coral power and it would not just be acro power relabeled it would be something different uh, because i like every product to have its own unique benefit uh, so um paula pal and, and paula pal thank you so much for the super chat has a uh, question for you um julian would love to hear what julian thinks about how we can move the aquarium hobby from one largely based on anecdotal information to one more primarily based on science. Um, I, I like the question. Uh, I want to say that having the ability to chat and share anecdotal information is probably the most valuable thing for the hobby. See, I went the opposite direction, but supplementing it with real science to explain why what we observe anecdotally works, that sort of seals the deal. It really uh, makes the observation have meaning. Uh, it takes it from the realm of superstition and brings it up to a level of academic understanding. If you have anecdotal observation alone, it doesn't help because people can make shit up. Excuse my French. Um, if you have scientific efforts alone, it's going to miss a lot. You really need both to make the hobby progress. Uh, so I'm happy for the anecdotal. I get dismayed when I see anecdotal stuff that's, that is truly um, superstition because, <laughs> you know, some of it you just know because you have the experience as I do. When I see anecdotal stuff that is totally new, I become fascinated as a scientist because I go, wow, just like the observation with the amino acids, I was blown away that uh, pure amino acids in solution have a, a benefit. They promote uh, fluorescent colors in corals. They promote growth. Um, they promote the polyp uh, tissue expansion. You won't find a single scientific paper saying that, having that observation and explaining why. It just, you know, it's not there. So taking what we see and matching it with the capable uh, scientifically trained person to then analyze it and do the proper experimentation to determine what's the cause of the observation. That's, that's the way we move forward. And I think that the hobby has been doing a lot of that. Uh, so that to me has been gratifying over more than 30 years that I've been involved in the hobby. So we yeah. have a, um, another question, uh, Greg Carroll, Greg, Good to uh, see you back out there watching. Uh, what is Julian's thoughts on protozoans causing acropora issues, and does he have any tips to avoid or control them? Ah, yeah, um, that's something that is designed to make us humble mm. um, because we have a common idea that if we control the water parameters, we get the nutrient levels right where we want them, got the temperature right where we want it, the water flow is exactly the way we want it, we're using the latest, greatest, best lighting, 
and we quarantined everything and it's all great, that don't matter. <laughs> you still have to be there as the gardener to catch it when it happens because those protozoans are going to get there. There's no holding them back. And every once in a while, they're going to hit your coral. And if you're not there when it happens and you're not looking carefully, um, the fire will burn because <laughs> it is like a forest fire. It will take out more coral than, than you'd like. If you catch it really early, you can nip it in the bud, you know, turn the water flow off, siphon the brown jelly when there's a protozoan infection, break off the affected coral, get online and post your pictures and say, damn, it happened to me again. <laughs> and then everybody will say, well, is it spring? Is there pollen in the air? And you can go, yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> well, that happened to me too. <laughs> you know, um, nobody really knows why the protozoans suddenly become active and, and attack your euphilia or your acropora or your seriatopora. Those are common genera that get hit by protozoans. Um, but if you're keeping those, it's going to happen. Uh, there's no avoiding it. Uh, so one thing I could tell you is that when a euphilia colony has gotten really big and beautiful and you're just looking at it in awe, that's about the time that that's going to happen. Mm. <laughs> wow. You know, you look at it one day and say, damn, that hammer coral is huge and big. The, even having the thought, you don't even have to say it. The protozoans are like, too good to be true. <laughs> We're coming, we're coming, uh, and and there there's something more than the mystical aspect of it too, because the bigger a colony gets, that affects water flow, and it's true that our strong water flow flow gets dampened by the branches or the size of a coral, and then the protozoans don't get blown off as easily, and so they have a chance to develop a good population, and once they do, bam, uh, there there is likely some. Uh, interaction between the protozoans and bacteria that are on the coral as well. But here's where we need microbiologists and science to really study the whole process. Um, fortunately, there are people working on that in the natural reef because these same infections occur in, in nature. Um, so maybe we'll learn a little bit more about it. I know there, there were a few publications out of maybe about three years ago um, that we're looking at um, using metronidazole and certain antibiotics to deal with uh, protozoan and, and white band bacteria type diseases in acropora corals. Um, you can do a Google search on, on some of those terms that I just mentioned and find them. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, sorry, there's no, um, no insurance, no guarantee. There's no process you can do to prevent it from happening in your tank. The very fact that you put corals in your tank means you've got the protozoans. They, they just come. So quarantining, yes. setting up a quarantine tank and trying to watch certain corals is not going to be 100% effective. It's, it's not 100%. And once it's not 100%, you know, you can quarantine all you want, uh, and it helps, but you're never going to prevent it all the way. No, uh -uh. that's like saying, can you absolutely set up a, a reef aquarium that has zero cryptocarrion in it? Just, there is none, doesn't matter what you do. The fish are not going to get it because it's not present. Um, theoretically it makes sense, but practically you just can't get there. There was actually somebody who wrote uh, it was a pamphlet back in the 1980s, I think. So they, they, I think they called it the Specific Pathogen-Free Marine Aquarium, something like that. And, you know, it, it made sense, you know, that you could quarantine and use certain chemotherapeutic agents to absolutely have ick-free fish that you then put in your ick-free aquarium and never have to deal with that. But um, public aquariums try to do that, and they still get ick. <laughs> there's, there's just no way to keep it out forever. Um, it's going to get there. Jenna L., thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Julian, It's we're, we're a little more than an hour into this thing, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. we got a couple of more um, questions. Hopefully sure. Uh, we can uh, 
problem. Have you stick around for for a little bit longer? Um, I, I'm happy happy to take the questions. And uh, so this one's from Leland Foley. Does Julian have any tips on keeping and or feeding sponges in reef aquariums? Yeah, I do keep quite a few sponges. I, I'm a spongophile too. <laughs> um, so there are sponges that you can keep, and there are ones that you can't. Um, uh, the, the ones that you can't uh, mainly need a lot of phytoplankton and perhaps bacteria plankton. So the, the good news is that in theory it is possible to keep them, um, but nobody's uh, been able to, to really develop a system where you have enough of the green water and bacteria going into the system. Um, perhaps even certain... Um, organic compounds that they that they also feed on. Um, but there are many, many sponges that are perfectly easy to keep. Um, you know, any any sponges that are photosynthetic, uh, they're, you know, simple. It's like keeping corals. And there are plenty of other ones that, that are perfectly happy with the levels of bacteria and organic matter that we have in our aquariums, and we see those mainly in our sump or on the back sides of live rock. There's even hobbyists that you know culture and trade sponges among themselves. Um, when I travel around, if I see a sponge that, that's proliferating in someone's tank and it's not one that I have, I like to get a frag of it, just like getting a frag of corals, because uh, you know I think they're really interesting. Um, there, there are sponges that have symbiotic um, dinoflagellates even uh, there's it's a a common species that you'll you get in on uh, zoanthid colonies and it it grows it's a almost black color really dark gray and it grows very thin fingers that can extend you know a foot or more tall it's brittle uh, about at maximum the size around of a pencil, but usually a little bit thinner. And if you take a bit of that and put it under a microscope, you'll see the dinoflagellates moving around. Um, very interesting. It's a photosynthetic sponge. It will grow in your sump without dinoflagellates, in which case it will be white. Uh, but uh, in the light, it has its symbiotic partner, and it's a strange, strange sponge. Uh, there are a few species of ball sponges that multiply rapidly. I call them little tribbles, like the Star Trek episode. Um, there, there are some that are fluorescent. I've seen fluorescent orange and fluorescent yellow. I have the yellow one. There is a, a dark brown, blackish one also. In, in Singapore, I saw one that was probably the same species as the dark brown blackish one, but they were green in Singapore. They have symbiotic uh, algae living with them. It's probably prochloron. It might be a dinoflagellate. I haven't looked to see. And they are sticky. So these are little ball guys. And if you're swimming in a reef in Singapore, or there's not much reefs, but a reef-like area, that you, when you get out, you'll find these things stuck to your... Uh, wetsuit. They're like Velcro. And in the aquarium, uh, they they multiply and they tend to stick to mobile invertebrates. You know, you'll see them stuck to starfish or sea urchins and whatnot. I love them. Uh, but to answer the question, Leland, um, to promote sponges, uh, feeding phytoplankton, um, anything that, um, you know, is in the water column and super, super fine. So bacteria plankton as well. Organics, uh, dissolved organic substances um, are, are going to help in two ways. The sponge will absorb them directly, and some of these organics, you know, like when you add vinegar uh, with kalkwasser, the organics promote uh, bacteria in the water, and that will promote sponge growth. Um, you might say, well, wait, wait a minute. I know sponges, are, they, they form uh, spicules that are made of silicate. Um, in general, our aquariums are not too limited on silicate, but they could be. And most of the sponges um, that we're successful with have very little silicate in them. They, they have basically sponge and more of an organic matrix. Um, 
And if you take sponges that are forming a, uh, a skeleton of, you know, the silicate spicules, and you try to keep them by dosing silicate in the aquarium, what you'll have is an aquarium full of diatoms, and the diatoms will coat the sponge, and the sponge will die. <laughs> so I tried this a long time ago. Um, now, if you, you were really working on a, a sponge aquarium and you wanted to try this, it would not be wrong to monitor the silicate level and try to maintain a certain level for them, but it's not the secret to, to their success. The secret really is food. Uh, they need the right size phytoplankton and they need a lot of it. Um, so I hope that helps. Well, that, that was a, uh, a very comprehensive and, and detailed, uh, answer. So I'm, hopefully they, uh, they, they got a lot out of that. Um, answer. Um, so we have another super chat, um, question. Thanks, Larry and Nira Nat. I think I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly and I might mispronounce this uh, word in this question. I'm probably, I've been accused of that. Uh, being an expert on cockwasser is a cockwasser or a calcwasser. I don't know. But uh, what do you think of calcium formate for alkalinity and calcium? Yeah, um, a, a lot of people do that. There's even commercial products on that. Um, whether calcium formate, calcium acetate, the, the idea is supplying calcium ions and um, a form of carbon that, that will balance the, uh, the, uh, the chemistry so that you have a balanced supplement for calcium and alkalinity. Um, and, you know, with acetate or, or formate, you, you've got an organic uh, supply there that also is, is promoting some uh, biological activity, as what we were just talking about with the sponges. Um, I, you know, I, I think you're better off with uh, two-part supplements or Kalkwasser or uh, a calcium reactor uh, if you're dealing with a very um, heavy growth of corals. Uh, but these um, single-part supplements of, of calcium and, and uh, organic carbon um, they have a, a use. There, there's a benefit, you know, in, in smaller systems or in systems with a, a light load of corals. Yeah. So Jake has another question. He uh, would like to know what are some corals on your wish list? Um, corals on my wish list. I do have a lot of corals, so <laughs> I'm rather satisfied, but, um, Ones that I would like to have. Hmm. I have tried keeping Australagyra a few times and only once had it grow. And unfortunately, it succumbed to the uh, blue photosynthetic sponge, which I had to keep taking off the colony and it's damaging to it. Um, that's a sponge that people call colospongia. But it's really, um, that's the wrong name for it. Uh, it's a thing called Ledenfeldia or something like that. Um, and it, it's a real problem once it, it gets in a tank and encrusts on corals. So Australagyra uh, is one that I'd like to get growing because I think it's very beautiful. Um, another wish coral. Let's see that I don't have. Mm, boy, that is tricky. Um, yeah, there's a um, galaxia uh, in that I, I have seen in the Solomons and in Fiji. It's called Posse Septa, and it forms um, flat plates with extremely tiny polyps. So it's not a galaxia that's likely to send out sweeper tentacles or bother anything. So you have these very lightweight plates that are fairly thick and super, super tiny polyps. Uh, and while it's not a, a colorful coral, it's actually structurally extremely beautiful. Um, so that's one I'd like. Another one is uh, Zopilus. Um, it's a fairly rare coral, but it does occur in Indonesia. 
I've never seen it imported. Um, a, a nice, an interesting story on that one. The first time I ever saw Zopilus was in Fiji. And I was visiting Fiji together with Bruce Carlson. And Bruce took me to this place where he had seen Zopilus about 20 years previously. This is back in 1995. Mm -hmm. And it was um, in Suva Harbor, believe it or not. And, and we, we went to this spot and he said, you know, here's where it is. I don't know how he knew and remember, but he must have been there enough and was impressed by what he saw. And the water was just green. It was a typical harbor. You know, you wouldn't think much was there. And it was uh, fairly deep down. So you started going through the green water and, and then it cleared up. And then once you got down there, um, first we had a, a deep dive that was breathtaking, amazing, the things we saw. And then we went to this place, and it was just an, an entire mound of Zopilus. And for those who don't know, Zopilus is a fungiid coral. It's something like Halomitra, like a dome coral. Okay, thin skeleton forms these domes, and it's kind of spiny. And honestly, God, he told us, or told me before we would see it, that it was just an entire reef that was made of Zopilus. And that's exactly what it was, a pile of Zopilus, of you know, and they fra because they're thin, they fragment a lot. Um, so God knows how long that thing had been there. You know, it probably goes down for <laughs> quite a bit, and it, it's formed a little mountain. And that was um, one of the only times I'd seen it, and I'd love to have that in my aquarium, and it would be great in the hobby because you could just fragment them. They're kind of like uh, the Cycloceros corals. They break very easily. Um, I could go on. I'm sure if I think hard about it, there are plenty of corals that I don't have and would want to have. But there's two ugly corals that I would like to see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my wish list is, is pretty big, but uh, it's always good to kind of have the uh, the ones that uh, are near that top of the list. And, hey, everybody's got a different oh. – uh, oh, you thought of another one? I mentioned – yeah, a couple. Soft corals. You know, there's a coral called Coelogorgia that's spelled C-O-E-L, Lagorgia. Um and it, the best way to describe it is it looks, you know, from a distance like a gorgonian, a uh, very thin branch gorgonian with really big, beautiful, fluffy, soft coral polyps. And the base of the branches is colored like um, what we call in the hobby cespitularia, but it's that's the wrong genus for that coral. It has this amazing blue purple that depending on the angle that you look at is either blue or purple uh, and so you have these branches with that color and these big fluffy polyps they they are related to xenia um, and they they form these crazy colonies but they're extremely difficult to ship that would be one i would love to have uh, in an aquarium build a display just nice. for it fast growing amazing that's coral. awesome uh, all right. Yeah. All right, Julian. So we, we're going to have one more super chat question Then I'm going to have sure. a final question for you. And then we're going to wrap it up because I don't want to keep you uh, too much longer. So it's the, fine. Uh, yeah. The super chat is from a Remar remarkable Reese. Thank you very much for the super chat uh, donation there. Um, he's asking both you and I, what are your thoughts on pH and keeping it higher for faster coral growth? And I'll add to the uh, question. What do you, what would you say is the butter zone for, um, you know, that higher end of pH? Well, um, you know, I think that Jake has written about that quite a bit. Uh, and and it, it, a few hobbyists have, have made this observation over the years. It, you know, the basic theory behind it is understanding that when you maintain calcium and alkalinity at saturation or at supersaturation, the higher the pH you maintain, uh, the easier it is for calcium carbonate to precipitate. Um, there is a slight risk uh, is that you could push it right to that uh, instant spontaneous precipitation zone and it can happen. Suddenly you get a snowstorm in your aquarium, in which case then your calcium and alkalinity will plummet temporarily. Um, but most of the time that doesn't happen because our corals are sucking out the calcium and alkalinity so quickly that it's a real challenge to maintain it at that supersaturated state. Pushing the pH higher makes them grow faster. 
faster. It's a very easily measured situation. So as far as the buttered zone, I don't know, Jake could chime in and, and say whether he's found a butter zone, but I think it's probably in the neighborhood of 8.4. Um, I, I don't know that you would want to really push it much higher than that. You can, uh, but for normal maintenance, it's probably 8.4. And, and that doesn't mean that everyone should strive to, to keep their pH at that level. Um, I think that maintaining a pH of 8.2 or even 8.1 is, is uh, fine. You know, that, that is achievable um, and, you know, it's all, all you need to do. A lot of us struggle to even get it there because in a, in a home that is a closed environment, the CO2 levels tend to push the pH uh, lower. And, and it's a struggle. So, uh, what do they say? Well, I'm just kind of yeah. laughing because we're getting some conversation that you, uh, you want to go longer on the live stream. And, and, uh, when I had uh, Jake on last week, I think we, we went over two hours and he was like, I can go for three hours. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can give you more time. It's not, not uh, a problem. Just, I think they're just, uh, having some fun with the, uh, with, with the fact that you were okay to answer a couple more questions. I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to push you too much uh, longer on this one, but um, uh, what uh, I'm just looking at the chat here again. Uh, Art, I see. Uh, yeah, ACI we peak at eight four two. Yeah, that, that's you know that's a common uh, high point and and really really boosts the uh, the corals. Once you get higher than that, your chances of precipitating the calcium and alkalinity are you know probably detract from the benefit of the boost of the pH. So, yeah. I mean, personally, yeah. I, I, um, I strive, you know, to have my pH in the eight, uh, one to eight, four range, you know, throughout the day. And, and, um, and I've talked about this before in prior shows, but I just had a, um, an air exchange unit installed in my basement, which is where I keep my uh, fish tanks. I live in Vermont. So in the winter time, the windows are shut tight. And yes. so that's, I've, I've definitely seen an increase of a 0.1 to 0.2 pH points due to that. And yes. I think that's certainly been helpful. Uh, and this is one of those funny things where being a reef aquarium hobbyist, you, you learn more about how to engineer your home uh, to make it healthy for the reef. And, you know, in many ways, that's probably healthier for you too. I um, definitely so felt the difference when that unit was installed. I was like breathing easier. I was like, it felt like I was sucking in fresh air that I had never really, yeah. um, you know, kind of noticed before. Yes. Correct. Yeah. No, I, so, uh, that's what I, I sort of figured that, um, uh, not only is it helping the, uh, the corals, but hopefully it's helping me. <laughs> yes. So Julian, uh, my final question to you is if you, if you had to give somebody a piece of advice in terms of the three most important things, um, you know, for having success with a, with a reef tank, what would they be? What would, what would those three things be if you had to just limit it to three things? I didn't, I didn't stump you, <laughs> did I? <laughs> there's, there's a lot more than three. I, I tell very, you that's right. You're, you're trying to. A very fat wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does that count as one of the three? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. An understanding spouse. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got two. <laughs> um, I've never heard those, no. but uh, they they certainly ring true. Yeah. No. No. So I'm 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 kind of talking it through. I, I, those aren't necessarily the the top three. Um, so to have a successful reef tank. Hmm. Hmm. You know, we could really talk about theory here, though. You know, that, that's a it's a challenging question because it, it depends on whether you're talking to a novice who wants to start a reef aquarium or to an experienced hobbyist who's saying, you know, how can I make my aquarium more successful and better? They're, they're really they are different answers. Well, let's let's go with the uh -huh. with the reef keeper who wants to kind of take it to the next level. If you had to, um, you know, give advice for that uh -huh. sort of person. Okay. Well, the, okay. They, and the thing is they may already have the, the three elements. Um, so, you know, what, what's really a foundation of success in reef keeping is having the calcium and alkalinity maintenance nailed. Okay. 
You really need to have that. You can't say, oh, I just changed the water. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a novice talking. Uh, if, you're, if it's a reef aquarium and you've got a lot of corals and you're trying to grow them, um, it's, you know, minutes to hours before you're, you've got a problem with your calcium and alkalinity. Uh, so there, that, that's definitely one of the, the three. Um, the fact that you've limited it to three makes it really hard to choose. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to say that because it's so important, temperature really has to be in that top three because you could have everything else right, but if your temperature is out of whack, you're going to fail. Um, if it's too hot, especially, or too cold, rarely that's going to be the case, um, doesn't matter how good your water quality is or anything that you're doing, you're going to fail. So temperature is really important. Um, and then... You know, I can't escape how important light is because our reef aquariums are so dependent on photosynthesis. Then it, it would have to be those, if I have to pick three, um, those three are going to be the primary ones. Um, yeah, we didn't even talk about lighting. <laughs> we didn't even talk, I yeah. didn't even ask you about lighting. No, you're welcome to do that. But, you know. Well, you know what, Julian, um, I think uh, we're going to save it for hopefully the next time you're on the show. If you're another, another yeah, talk, that would be yeah. awesome. And that'll be great. Uh, but, you know, after we finish, I'll probably sit back and think, darn, you know, there's other important things because what's true is there's more than three. Um, and, and the spouse factor that Tony Vargas brought up, uh, is a real one. Uh, and, and yeah, having the money to, to make this, uh, happen is, is real. Uh, I think a lot of people deal with that by getting into, uh, micro coral farming <laughs> to help support their habit. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not a hobby for sissies. It, you know, there can be some expenses, but it's very rewarding. And all the investment you put into it of time and money, uh, are worth it. You know, well, uh, really I, I, for one would, uh, cringe if I actually knew the amount of money that I had spent in this hobby over the years. I do not want to know that number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Julian, listen, yes. thank you, um, so much for, for being a guest on the ch show. I know, um, a lot of, uh, the viewers yeah. just, uh, had a lot of questions and really enjoyed, you know, listening to you and, and watching, uh, you know, and, and the advice you had. So would love to have you back on, on a, on a future show. We'll be happy to do that. Thank you very much for inviting me, Keith. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah, for sure. So, folks, that's going to do it for this show. And I um, want to give my sincere thanks to uh, Julian for, for being a guest on the live stream tonight. My next show is going to be on next Thursday, February 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm going to have Austin Lefebvre from 10G Aquarium Design and Build On. So that should be a um, another great show. Yeah. So anyway, folks, um, stay safe, be well, and we will see you next time. Adios. Adios. Thank you, Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Julian.